thanks um thanks so much everyone for having me uh, it's great to be with all of you virtually i see a bunch of uh ice modelers in the crowd which is nice uh, i'm going to go through this kind of um introduction to ice sheet modeling and my work implementing novel physics in it i am sam Paycheck, a postdoc at the university of michigan and I want to talk, tell you a little bit about how ice sheets evolve and with the oceans and the atmosphere and the earth and us. Uh, but first, I, let's see, would like to acknowledge some of the people that make my research possible. Um, I work at the University of Michigan within the Ice Dynamics or Vintage Glaciology Group, uh, head by Jeremy Bassis with um, Morgan Whitcomb, Ray Watkins, Lydia Gilbert, and Matt Cathels as current members. I work with Dan Martin a lot, and Steve Price, and Matt Hoffman. Uh, and of course, thank you to NERSC for keeping all of those computational infrastructures running uh, that my work absolutely depends on. Now, sea level is what I study. The scientific consensus, which was recorded in a painstaking and political process, uh, called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, says that the last century saw about 20 centimeters of sea level rise. But there's significant uncertainty in the next century. You can see those bars diverging away, not least of which because we still exert some agency in constructing that future. The models in the most recent report, which just came out, suggest anywhere between 30 centimeters and one meter of sea level rise under what we might call normal worst case scenario situations by 2100. This is possibly still a conservative estimate. One, because it was a consensus document and which produces pressure um, that Michael Oppenheimer calls to err on the side of least drama. But also because new physics are emerging as important for sea level science that have been separated out of the main projection distribution as what you see here, low likelihood, high impact storylines, um, some of which we're gonna be talking about today. Before we jump into that and the technical stuff, I'd like to just take a moment to look at what sea level looks like. By a recent estimate, 1 billion people, that's more than 10% of the world's human population, live within 10 meters of high tide. Here are some photographs from Gideon Mendel of extreme flooding events though maybe extreme isn't right anymore, as these events have become more and more commonplace. As both the severity of storms and the background sea level that I'll be talking about upon which those storms surge have increased. These portraits are taken around the world because the problem is a global problem. But like Pete Seeger used to say, we need to think lo locally and, uh, sorry, think globally and sing locally. And some of the most respons important responses to sea level can come from, from our own local interactions. For example, how our municipal municipalities zone for future building and prepare for the displacement and disruption of peoples. For reference, everything west, and I looked this up, of San Pablo Street, Street in Berkeley uh, is below 12 meters above current sea level. And that's exactly the sea level benchmark of Houston that saw historic flooding when Hurricane Harvey hit it in 2017. Areas where newly deregulated housing was being constructed by large scale developers in known flood zones. That hurricane brought in a storm surge of about, I think seven, seven meters similar to this, the Hurricane Ike storm surge that washed out large communities that were unable to easily pick up or move or easily afford the higher premiums on flood insurance. So having, having set the stage in that way as a human and global and non-human problem, I wanna ask how does global mean sea level change and how is it changing to increase the likelihood of flooding events like these? A substantial amount of water has been locked up as ice sitting on the continents. Antarctica is the largest ice mass on the planet with a continuous presence of ice over the last 40 million years. Right now it stores about 60 meters of sea level rise, but not all of that ice will contribute to sea level all at once. And a lot of our research is focused on the amount of ice uh, that has fluctuated in the past and how it might go in the future. Up through the 90s, dominant scientific thought was that 
ice responded very slowly to changes in the atmosphere, the climate, the oceans, but we've since seen that things can happen extremely quickly. Like we saw when the Larsen ice shelf collapsed over just two months in 2002. It had been sitting there, the Larsen ice shelf, about 10,000 years of relative stability, forming its own ecosystems. Then after a few decades in, of, uh, of warming, it just took two months to disintegrate an area the size of Rhode Island, or again, I looked it up to localize it, uh, around the San Francisco Bay. That All of that ice was floating though, that you see here kind of collapsing and recollapsing. And we know that when ice floating in our cup melts, it doesn't have a significant direct impact on the level of the fluid. But ice is definitely coming off of the continent. In fact, our observations indicate that mass loss coming from Antarctica has been accelerating over the past 30 years, reaching about a millimeter per year presently. But how does that ice become water in the oceans? How do we get that ice that's on the land into the water? Let's start by asking, is ice a fluid or a solid? This, by the way, is an aerial photo that I really love of Thwaites Glacier we're going to be kind of in and around Thwaites Glacier a lot today and its neighbor, Pine Island. In fact, it's kind of both a solid and a fluid. If you push on a large block of ice, let me set this, set this running. Um, it, the deformation happens primarily in one of two ways. Either the ice cracks, forming crevasses that might eventually turn into icebergs, that you can watch happening in the Amudsen Sea. So this is Thwaites, the one we jet, we're just looking at on the bottom. Let's see if I can um, get my laser pointer out. Thwaites and Pine Island Glacier. This is a floating bit of Pine Island Glacier. You can see these regular calving events as the, as the, 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 the tension on the ice is ripping it apart. Or the ice flows downstream. It, those crevasses are moving bit by bit as a little fluid going downstream more easily seen in, seen in this uh, zoomed up region on the of Pine Island Glacier. And there's Pine Island's shear margin with slow moving grounded ice over here. My research has been into both that flowy motion and the cracking motion. We're gonna start with a, an introduction, though I see a lot of uh, ice dynamicists in the crowd, I'm going to still kind of introduce the basics behind ice sheet modeling, its evolution, and some proposed instability mechanisms. I'm going to talk about how the Earth may not be so solid as, as we thought and might contribute or, to uh, the ice dynamics. And then we're going to talk about the role of stable and stabilizing ice shelves and how in our models those aren't so stable. Microscopically, ice deforms primarily along grain boundaries, little, little small boundaries, imper imperfections when the ice crystallizes. Macroscopically, the continuum deformation of ice occurs by a straightforward force balance. Because it's the slow, viscous flow, it all, the ice always balances out the stresses put on it. One consequence of that is that the flow of ice very strongly depends on what's happening under the glacier and at its sides. Is it floating? Is the ground it's sitting on slippery? Or is the glacier frozen to a hard bed? These we call the basal drag conditions. Is the glacier confined in a valley or free to expand out? What's its lateral drag conditions? Is something like a whole lot of ice pushing back on the front or is it the huge mass of ice essentially free to barrel forward under, under the force of gravity? And here we come back to the effects of the disintegration of the Larsen ice shell. So the ice itself that we saw kind of fracturing out and going out to sea was floating. And so that ice that broke apart didn't raise sea levels. Its disappearance changed the force balance on the glaciers that fed it. These glaciers began accelerating draining the grounded ice and increasing sea levels. Ice is not an ordinary or linear fluid. If you push on water twice as hard, the water basically moves twice as fast. With ice, best as we can tell, the relationship between the st stress and strain rate, the rheology, is to the third or fourth power. Push on it twice as hard, 
and it moves eight times as fast. So snow falls on the continent. I guess it may be over here. Snow falls on the continent. The snow freezes under pressure into what's called an ice sheet. And the ice sheet flows to the margins of the continent, where maybe it meets the ocean and thinning enough begins to float outward over the ocean, where it melts or fractures and then melts after it's fractured out there. The interface between the grounded and the floating uh, ice is called the grounding zone or grounding line. And because of the big changes in stress, when the ice suddenly begins to float and the nonlinearity of the rheology of the fluid, the flux through the grounding line strongly depends on the thickness there. This puts us in a possible situation where on certain glacier beds, ones that slope downward inland, if the grounding line is pushed backwards, let's say by an increase in melt, it's pushed into deeper water. The flux through the grounding line is greater, pushing it into deeper water still, a positive feedback that ends in the total disintegration of the ice sheet. This has come to be called the marine ice sheet instability in the community. But melting the bottom of the ice shelf is only one possibility. What if instead something caused the floating portion to disappear completely, maybe all at once? And I apologize for the backwards flow in this figure uh, from Wise et al. I really like it, except that it, it goes from right to left instead of my usual left to right. Uh, remember those surface crevasses that we looked at in Pine Island? Well, if water melts off the surface and it can find one of those, particularly if it's able to find one sort of close to here, the water in, in enters the crevasse, increases the pressure at the crevasse tip, and it can drive fracture all the way to the bottom, a process called hydrofracturing. If these hydrofractures all coalesce, the entire floating portion can detach from the grounded portion, leaving behind an ice cliff. The weight of that cliff, unchecked by ice in front of it, might now exceed the ice's brittle strength, causing it to break. Now it's in deeper water, thicker ice, exposing another higher ice cliff, breaking off and going again and again until the ice cliff is able to stabilize against, let's say, a new ridge in the ocean floor and form another stabilizing floating ice shelf. As it happens, though, modeling the formation of these floating stable and stabilizing ice shelves isn't trivial, uh, we'll, which we'll kind of hit at the end. But are there ice sheets that actually are vulnerable to these mechanisms? Are there marine terminating ice sheets whose bedrock slope inward and who have, are, are fronted by a lot of, by, by large ice shelves? Well, as it happens, much of the bedrock in West Antarctica, over here, lies currently below sea level. And right here in the Amundsen Sea, this is where we were looking at that satellite imagery before. The slope of the bed definitely deepens upstream of the current grounding lines shown here in black of both Pine Island and Thwaites glaciers. Both of these are also held by held back in part by floating ice shelves at their at their fronts, pinned at their bottoms and, and their sides by topographic features. So we've identified these glaciers as being particularly vulnerable because warm water from a deep ocean current called the circumpolar deep water has been making its way up onto the shallow bay floor, increasing the subglacial melt and threatening to push that grounding line into the inexorable collapse of the marine ice sheet instability. And once that retreat has started, as shown um, in, by, by, these, by these two papers, both of which used uh, the, the same ice model that I'll be using, bicycles, it can take a larger ocean, a, a larger decrease in ocean melt to stop it than the increase that initiated it. But even still, there's a significant spread in the timing of the, of the collapse. Similarly, atmospheric forcing, these things called um, uh, atmospheric forcing from a warmer atmosphere threatens to increase the amount of water melting on the surface which uh, coursing into the crevasses causes those hydrofracturing, exposing unstable cliffs and initiating that ice cliff instability. So with those instabilities and those kind of vague threats on our mind, 
we're going to look at some of the physics uh, behind those and, and some of the some of the new physics that I've been trying to implement um, to interrogate those those dynamics. We'll start off with the not so solid Earth. Here's again our favorite, well, my favorite. I, I love this um, satellite image. The theory of the marine ice sheet instability was based on the assumption of a fixed bed. The Earth isn't changing underneath the ice, which is probably an okay assumption in most places around the globe. But the West Antarctic ice sheet is over, as it happens, West Antarctica, with its trans-Antarctic mountain range and an attendant rift system all around here basically volcanism. This topography doesn't come from nothing. Now, what could that have to do with anything? Let's, let's look deeper. Let's look under the ice and quite a bit under the ice. Into the mantle. The ice sits on the crust, which is the topmost part of the lithosphere, a chemical, thermal, and mechan mechanical boundary layer of the deeper mantle. The mantle below is hot enough that much like the ice, it creeps in response to stresses. One of those stresses is the centrifugal acceleration from the planet's rotation. So the equator of the Earth is about 21 kilometers further from the center of the Earth than the poles are. Another stress is the redistribution of mass on the surface that comes from, say, moving around huge amounts of ice. We call that deformation glacial isostatic adjustment. You'll see it abbreviated as GIA. As water precipitates onto the continents and lingers there between seasons to form ice sheets, the first response is elastic, compressing the crystalline structure beneath it, causing the surface to subside. There's also an instantaneous gravitational signal. Now all that mass attracts ocean stuff to it. Over time, the mantle creeps away from under the ice sheet, causing the surface to subside further still until it's in equilibrium with the buoyant forces. The surface drops about a third of the ice sheet's height, given the differences in density. By mass conservation, the mantle material's got to go somewhere, and so it begins to uplift the surface in areas away from the ice sheet. As the ice melts, this process repeats itself in the opposite direction, first an elastic spring up, and then slow viscous uplift. At the mantle's average viscosity, this relaxation takes thousands of years. In fact, the globe today is still relaxing from the loss of the ice sheets in North America and Scandinavia over from the last ice age. And those were gone mostly by 10,000 years ago. Let's bring this back to the ice dynamics. Remember how the ice sheet moving into deeper water meant it started to flow out more. Well, if the surface is able to respond quickly enough to the retrieving ice mass loss, sorry, the ice mass loss, it could locally decrease sea level and stabilize that grounding line. Because of how slowly the average mantle takes to deform, again, about thousands of years, this has typically been considered a fairly small effect, particularly for present day ice losses. But, sorry, my slide is there. Some areas like the parts of the West Antarctic have a viscosity several orders of magnitude lower as a result of their part particular tectonic histories. For instance, watching the travel times of particular seismic waves, we've recorded regions uh, where the waves take significantly longer to traverse, usually indicating, so over here, kind of down here, you can see these red spots, greener spots, usually indicating warmer, more fluid material. Similarly, continuous GPS measurements of the surface show an extremely fast uh, response to ice losses today indicative again of this low viscosity. And so this is one of the things that I've been at work modeling, incorporating these solid earth effects in the already challenging nonlinear flow of ice dynamics. It can be a little trickety and um, the community is kind of finding ways to do it. So let me take a sec and say that a lot of my work has been done using the bicycles ice sheet model, which is a finite volume vertically integrated model that takes advantage of the large horizontal aspect ratio to simplify the equations of motion of, uh, of, of ice flow, the momentum conservation, we compute the velocity consistent with the bottom and side boundary conditions, the top zero traction condition and gravitational driving forces using a kind of shallow ice approximation where the flow largely balances the gravitational force, although modified 
to capture the transition between grounded and floating ice. Uh, this is particularly good for large ice sheets. It simplifies the computation and it, it gets most of the flow right. Bicycles also uses adaptive mesh refinement to capture the dynamics of, of that grounding line and where things are really moving quickly. Um, yeah. Now my dissertation work was on spherically symmetric self-gravitating viscoelastic deformation, the whole kit and caboodle. Uh, but for computing the vertical response of the isolated low viscosity zone in the Amundsen Sea, we choose to use a simpler flat earth approximation to these equations. These can be summed up with this phenomenological equation. The viscous force is captured here for displacement u, it's velocity du dt, this is vertical. Uh, the second term is the buoyancy force of displacing mantle material. The third is the support from a thin elastic beam. We have this biharmonic traditional from, a, from elastic uh, elastic flexure from a load, ice load, and we need to keep track of the ocean, how the oceans are loading the surface, changes in both ice and ocean. What's really nice about this flat earth uh, approximation is that it's easily solved in the foyer domain. You can see exactly right, all of the, the divs, all of the nablas, these, these derivatives become wavelengths. And so it's, it's just about free compared to solving for the ice velocity. This, we update it. I said that bicycles uses uh, adaptive mesh refinement. We're able to update the GIA heat track of it only on the coarsest grid because it's much smoother than the ice dynamics. Now it doesn't account for, let's say things like the self-gravitation or the vertical structuring of the Earth's elastic um, uh, behaviors, but these are gonna be really small, especially when we're looking at a concentrated area. So looking at it, We'll watch what happens at Pine Island with a locally very low viscosity mantle. The plot on the top left shows the change in ice thickness above flotation. That's the stuff that raises sea level with a fixed bedrock. This is the fixed bedrock. The one on the top right shows what happens with a mantle that has a rapid viscoelastic response. The initial topography is shown, oh, sorry, yeah, bottom left. Um, and the vertical displacement is what I meant, is shown here in the bottom right. Now, as we begin to, to ramp up, we see that the, everything is really kind of following along this, the same path. With, a, with the bulk of this uplift occurring by the grounding line. Now, right about now, we see that that uplift has started to catch up and take place with greater uplift behind the grounding line. Flow is coming down this valley. Now they're really beginning to, to differ quite a bit as that uplift is accumulating behind the grounding line that's seeing that uplift. Now at the end, as we get to 150 kilometers, it's about 100 kilometers behind where it is without the solid earth deformation. So what we've seen is about 90 meters of uplift with causing a delay of, of the, again, because of that re relation between the flux through that grounding line and the, the thickness of the ice above sea level. We can summarize that, those results by integrating the thickness over flotation over the, that entire domain and plotting how much ice is lost or the equivalent in um, sea level rise. The sea level difference from including the response of that low viscosity mantle is 17 millimeters over that 150 years. It's about 30%, which is significant. We're extending that previous study, which was published in uh, Geophysical Research Letters, to include a larger domain, both Pine Island and Thwaites, and a broader set of representative forcings. These, the plan is to use the, all of the IPCC reports, uh, forcings. Each one of these runs, I should mention, takes a few thousand core hours uh, for, the, for the 100 years. So many thanks to NERSC uh, and their support. This work is also being done uh, with Matt Hoffman in Mali, another ice dynamics model. Um, right now, in particular, looking at the Thwaites Glacier, corroborating the same observation that that uplift uh, significantly impacts the ice dynamics. 
Now that rate that we saw is fast, right? That's a meter per year. But the velocities out here where we actually have stations are relatively small and we're able to capture them, capture that, that movement. And it's worth also keeping in mind that that 90 meters is only about a third of the total 300 meters of uplift that isostatic equilibrium would, would occur uh, after the removal of about a kilometer of ice. So it's, it's um, definitely within the range of possibility and observing it is gonna be tricky as it takes place in such a, such a small area with fast moving ice. To recap, because of that land motion, we see that the flux can in fact decrease and stabilize slightly. It's not, it's not, it's not, a, it's not gonna stop the flow. Uh, at least we haven't seen any cases where that'll happen yet, um, but it, it will change again that timing. Now, for in the last in the last few minutes of the, of the presentation, before we we get to chatting, uh, I'd like to can I turn off my laser pointer to play this again? Yeah, I want to move to talking about that other mechanism, the marine ice cliff instability. Remember that the important thing for the ice cliff instability was the ability of the glacier to sometimes create a relatively stable ice shelf. Recall the Larsen ice shelf's ten thousand years of stability, and then to sometimes break off to have that big mechanically unstable ice cliff. But a stationary ice shelf isn't actually, a stable ice, ice shelf rather, isn't actually stationary. This ice is constantly moving from where it's being deposited as snow, kind of up, up, up in this area, down to the ocean where it goes and floats off and then breaks off. That calving behavior is extremely important and difficult to capture in continental ice sheets models. But if we look a little bit closer, we can see that there are a lot of features on the ice. There are patterns you can pick out, like sets of ridges along the shear margin. We can see some, some bumps and things representing not necessarily topography underneath the ice, but something happening within the ice. We'd like to reason from those. And because we're putting this in a continental scale model, We'd like to have a continuum description. We'd like that so that, especially so that we don't have to keep track of every single individual crack, say using linear elastic fracture mechanics um, with time scales moving seconds. So maybe, maybe we could think about a tensor fracture density that if it's not gonna keep track of every single individual fracture, it'll at least keep some kind of measure of the anisotropy of those fractures. That's kind of, it's kind of on the bounds of our observational and computational abilities right now to initialize all of that, all of those, all of those uh, behaviors, directions and sizes. So we'll leave those individual cracks behind and treat only nice isotropic fractures, which we see here as penny fractures, making our ice little volume element look like Swiss cheese. How do these fractures evolve over the timescales of ice flow though? To get there, we're actually gonna zoom out to a slightly different isotropic picture to a kind of vertically averaged crevasse depth. And this is gonna include importantly, long wavelength crevasses. Remember that the ice is shear thinning. So when you push on it a little bit harder, it flows a lot more. So if we perturb the thickness of the ice, the forces on that ice, are applied over a smaller area. That increases the apparent stress seen by this block, seen by our block of ice, decreasing the effective viscosity and driving further thinning. A process that continues until that long wavelength crevasse or neck pinches off the thickness, something we can understand as a calving event. Via a perturbative approach, uh, Bassus and Ma found that the rate of crevasse growth, let's play this again. The rate of the crevasse growth relative to the thickness of the, of the ice, this is the damage, the, the ratio of the crevasse depth, including this long, long wavelength component to the full thickness of the ice, depends on the competition between the hydrostatic or cryostatic pressure tending to flow ice back into the crevasses and, and fill it in, and the tensile forces pulling them back open. 
And we've implemented this, this continuum damage model into bicycles where the crevasses advect with the ice according to the ice velocity and grow according to that necking instability. For an unconfined ice tongue that essentially flows in one direction, you can see, I, I, I love that it just kind of sticks out like that, flowing in one direction. Um, this one's called Drygalski ice tongue. The crevasses reach through the entire thickness and we predict just about where we observe that calving front. So here we have our, our model from bicycles, our numerical model, and these are observations. And the length is fairly good, definitely within the, the error. And the thickness is really good. But this ice tongue isn't exerting a significant backward stress on that grounded glacier. It's mostly being pushed along by the weight of the ice behind it and its tendency to, to stretch out. So if we took, take a look uh, at an ice shelf that's actually between confined walls, here the Amory ice shelf, we're now deep in East Antarctica, the situation is different. We approximate all of this complicated domain of grounding lines and mountains and things uh, with a simple simple geometry of just rectangular, no slip walls and a single flux coming in from the left. The damage in this model, if we don't allow the damage that, that, that making us ability to actually remove ice, we just kind of see what it would predict without actually removing the ice. Uh, it predicts a decent, decently well, in the, even in this simple model, the length of the, of the ice shelf. Again, this is a, without calving occurring. That damaged ice continues to be bound to the rest of the ice and it behaves like undamaged ice. So what happens if we actually remove it? Well, when we start allowing the removal of the damaged ice, the ice contacting our no slip wall right here. So I'm gonna, I'm removing it in iterations. I'll run it to steady state without allowing any to be removed. I'll take off all of this damaged ice and then I'll go again. Uh, it always tends to damage to critically damaged ice where it's touching. And that'll mean that the floating ice is no longer in contact with the lateral bounds, these no slip walls, and it'll provide no buttressing stress to the, to the what we have not modeled, but the glacier that would be behind it feeding it. This difficult, difficulty in forming these stable buttressing ice shelves has been noted in other models of damage evolution and calving. Uh, so usually some amount of parameterization is needed. But remember that those ice shells are extremely important. That was what was preventing that ice cliff from forming in the first place. So here we come back for the last time to the Amundsen Sea, evolving in the damage again without removing any ice. Uh, it shows us that the ice in those shear margins are fully damaged. So if we started allowing that ice to be removed, um, then this is an ice tongue ready to completely detach from its connecting points. But you saw in those satellite pictures, we definitely observe those ice shelves. So there are still some physical processes that we are working to address in how ice sheets grow these ice shelves so that we can evaluate the possibility of losing them and initiating an unstable cliff collapse that could dump meters of sea level equivalent uh, into the ocean over the next century. <sighs> and with that, I would like to thank you and move to taking questions. Yes, thank you very much. That's fascinating. Um, yeah, well, we have time for some questions if anybody wants to, to ask any, it's just, um, I'm just I'm just amazed at the at, at these physical systems and the complexity of the problem that you are trying to that you are trying to solve and that you, you've been able to. It's um, uh, I'll start with a couple of questions. It is uh, one I had was it is such a complex system and there are so many effects that go into something like this. Are there are there things that um, you'd really really like to to add in that you're currently doing or that you would like to um, be able to model and remove some parameterizations or something? What do you think are the most important things? Um, so I, I, I think I think it'll be really important. I mean, I, I think as a, as a community as a whole, when you're looking at, let's say, some of these longer scale ice flows, the glacial isostasy 
it'll become it's important to get the numbers right. It depends on uh, the the scale that we're looking at. Um, the flat Earth model is definitely is definitely doable for a first pass of like continental scale stuff. Um, there are a lot of other details that you need to get right for a continental scale simulation. Uh, so whether whether you need to go right into like accounting for you, we saw all of those that that extreme heterogeneity um, right between West Antarctica and East Antarctica. And so there's there's there are kind of different pushes on how how you need to treat that and whether you need to go right away to a full kind of a uh, full complicated 3D viscoelastic structure. And so I, I would like to I, I would like to know a bit more about kind of the, the degree to which those those hetero, heterogeneities affect the flow um, in particular. And that you know there are, there's there's a lot of good work being put into that. Um, on that side. On the other side in the in the calving model, I think there's I think there's a significant amount of work. It's particularly um, in, in getting from the small scale, so I, I didn't I didn't fully give credit, um, but there were a couple of really good papers that came out. Let's see where 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 is it? Um, by Anna Crawford and, and colleagues and Jeremy uh, that showed in in small situations kind of how actually when you form that ice cliff there is the chance for viscous flow. To, to compensate some of that cliff before there's just this kind of immediate collapse that was the initial hypothesis for the marine ice cliff instability. And so I think some combination of getting getting those right. I mean, I, I, I think that the damage mechanics is a is a is going to be a really useful if, if any, because it, it relies on what seems like a pretty straightforward consequence of the ice's flow. Um, but that's going to be really dependent on our observational abilities and our ability to tie what we see to our damage variable. So I think I think there's not going to be it, the shorter answer. I think there's not going to be a getting rid of parameterizations, um, but a kind of a a, a tying a, a tying of those of those observations to the physical mechanisms that are important. Okay. Yeah. If other people have, have questions, just, just raise your hand and otherwise I'll, I'll keep, I'll keep going here. So remind me uh, what the, uh, the length of the, you know, the physical time scale that the simulations cover the length of time. So for the, the these, th this simulation that I'm showing up here, it got to steady state in a bit. So, so I, what I, what I hear, I've just kind of started it out with what we see today. And I've not let the thickness, I've not let the ice change at all. I'm just trying to get that damage to look like what it would look like. Um, and so this one took about 60 years. It takes, it takes, you know, about about that long for ice to sort of get to the front. Um, in the in the the Amory case, it took quite a bit longer to get everything kind of sta stabilized out. That was closer to, I think it was thousand years is what I needed to run. To have that kind of long, narrow confinement. Uh, so, do you have any feedback um, effects, um, not only the effects of the ice melting, but maybe other things that are happening globally that that could affect um, this, like changing temperature, precipitation, ocean currents, salinity, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, the ocean, the the ocean and the atmospheric forcings are going to be changing definitely on those on those time scales. Um, I mean, so when I'm when I'm looking to go forward, the IPCC, you know, and, and collective projects, um, these model and intercomparison projects have established norms for how we project these forcings out to the future, and they depend. So, you know, they they create certain pathways. They say, well, maybe we're only get, maybe we're going to emit so much CO2 and cause so much atmospheric forcing, and then you give that over to an Earth system model. Uh, to tell you what the ocean, how the ocean is going to respond to that. And from that, you kind of, you put together those disparate parts into a forcing package that you give to the ice sheet model. Um, the, ideally, at some point, all of these things get mashed together so that we're including all of these dynamics all at once. Uh, and I, yeah. Yeah, interesting. So this was Antarctica. Um, if you were to try to do something similar for, say, someplace else like Greenland or something like that, is there something that's fundamentally different? 
So there, we don't see the temperatures in Greenland, let's say, you don't see significant uh, formation of ice shells just from, okay. from the way. So, so their calving behavior is actually pretty significantly different. Mm -hmm. when, you have, when you have these floating ice shells, like we saw at Pine Island, you tend to have these enormous tabular icebergs. So they break off in enormous sections. Whereas the, the, the calving behavior in Greenland tends to be a little bit more continuous and uh, a little bit smaller. Great, there's a, there's a question in chat. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, um, let's see. Mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the two components of sea level change give a sense of how the change in sea surface height. Uh, so are, are you talking, Sophie, about the, the eustatic component? No, sorry. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Thank you. Um, so I, the, um, in, in GIA models, typically we also model the changes in sea surface height. Um, as you mentioned, the, the, as you decrease mass, um, you change the, the gravitational uh, um, equipotential that defines the sea surface height. Yeah, the, the, geoid, the geoid change is tiny when you're looking. So, so in those simulations, in these simulations, I'm only considering the effect of the local load and ocean changes. So looking only at that, actually the geoid is, is very small uh, and, and any, any gravitational signal that, uh, um, that, might, that might have occurred from kind of mantle movement. And one of the reasons that I think that is, is because it's so rapid that you're basically almost always in uh, equilibrium. And so you have an elastic component that's very small because a lot of it is just being supported by elastic stresses in the crust. So the crust is able to, to kind of spring without moving a whole lot because those, those lows are so short wavelength. Um, and because the, visc the, the mantle moves away so quickly from it that there's essentially no geoid signal locally. Okay, so you're essentially saying the changes in mass of the ice is like, like almost instantaneously compensated by the, the changes in mass of the movement of the mantle, I guess. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'll throw in another random question for you. Um, but, and so it looks like there's a competition between you know, melting of the, the, the glaciers and the, the, the land ice basically, and the rebound of the continent because of the, the weight that's being lost. Um, so, so who's going to win for Antarctica? Is, uh, is, is Antarctica the, the land mass above sea level growing or shrinking? So, sorry. Oh, the, the melting is, is going to, so far, we, I haven't seen reason to believe, and there's no, there's no topographic feature that's easily rebounded to a point where you can actually reverse that, at least as, at least as far as I can tell so far. Um, so so it, it'll change, once again, it'll change the timing at which this occurs. And again, that'll depend, these, these, the, the, the effect, the, the size of that effect is, is still relatively small compared to, um, oh, sorry, uh, relatively small compared to uncertainties and forcings. So yeah, I mean, the, 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 the ice is melting. The, it's coming off of the continent. It's a, it's a question of timing and how we prepare for it. Great. Yeah, it's really fascinating. Any other last minute questions? Okay, well, thank you again. And, um, that's a great talk. One more. Is there time for Hannah to ask? Oh, there we have Han Hannah. You have another question. Hi, sorry. Um, it might be a stupid question, but you said um, that the so the modeling the cracks in the ice is really difficult because of the having a really small time step. Um, I was wondering if like could you use like an adaptive time step to kind of target those areas that have really difficult cracks, or are they kind of all difficult to measure to model? Yeah, I, I mean we we've we've talked about what that would take. Uh, I think right now, still on the continental scale, the, the scale difference is enormous between the size of the crack and the and the size of the the, the ice the ice shelf. Um, so, so I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's possible that we are able to resolve at least some of those those cracks that we identify as like those uh, shear crevasses or something. But the processes that drive those and that might uh, being able to initialize those with Kind of information that we might have about the ice fabric is still really hard to get. There are some really cool experiments on getting that ice fa fabric sounding and radar stuff. Um, but I, I think 
I think that'll that, that'll present its own set of very cool challenges in initializing that those cracks. Okay, thanks again. And uh, I I did I neglected to ask you at the beginning if you minded this was being recorded, and we'll um, we'll post it on on our YouTube site once we get it processed. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you for uh, everything you guys do.